Hey everyone, welcome to another Dapper Community Call. This is number 105. It's June 12, 2024, and I'm Mark Dyker, one of the Dapper Community Managers. Um, before we start, it's always nice to know where you're coming from. Uh, so feel free to use the comments to share uh, where you're viewing from. Um, we are streaming to YouTube, but also to um, Twitter, X, uh, and also to uh, LinkedIn. So um, thank you for, for joining this, uh, this live stream. Uh, we've made the change like a, a couple of months ago to switch from, from Zoom to YouTube. Um, yeah, many of us like it. Um, I'm very curious what, what you all think about it. Um, has some of the house rules um, during these sessions, because there will be, be two sessions later. I'll show uh, share the agenda soon. If you have any questions, please write them down as comments uh, in, um, uh, in YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the comments on, uh, on Twitter or X. So uh, I think the best place is uh, to use YouTube uh, to view there, uh, put in the comments there. Um, and either um, the presenter will actually um, have a look at your questions and answer them like on the spot um, or I will ask the questions after the session is, uh, is over. So please use the comments there. All right, let's have a look at the agenda. So first, there's a session by um, Mark Rexwinkel, and that's named uh, Generate a Depper Workflow from BPNN. Uh, I had like a short preview um, like a couple of weeks ago. It looks like a really exciting. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. And after that session, we have Ryan Winter talking about Azure IoT operations and Depper pluggable components, also a very exciting topic. Um, and we'll close off with some community show and tell where I will highlight some of the community created blog posts and YouTube videos. All right, it's uh, it's time for you, uh, Mark. I will uh, stop my uh, screen sharing and I will add you to the stage. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm going to try and share my screen. And I think I have. Yep, so, that's there. <clears throat> um, yeah, I want to have to talk about um, generating Dapper workflows from a BPMN uh, diagram. Um, a while back uh, at KubeCon uh, last year in North America, I was talking to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Edwin van Rijk. He also did some, some work on the Dapper community. And there's also some examples uh, on Dapper workflow. And I was talking to him, to him uh, during, uh, during a bar session. Um, and um, we came to talk about Dapper workflow, and we both have customers that also uh, work with BPMN um, uh, diagrams and software using engines like Amunda. Uh, and we were sort of talking about, is, would it be possible to use uh, BPMN to actually uh, generate a Dapper workflow from the BPMN diagram? So basically using BPMAN as a visualization tool and then afterwards with a bit of annotation, uh, uh, is it possible to uh, generate a, a Dapper workflow uh, from, from, this, from this diagram? So I started working on that during uh, QCOM and uh, we set a couple of goals. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, is it possible to generate a semantically equ equivalent workflow? And what I mean with that is that if you look at BPM but diagram and all the constructs that you can use, it is not always trivial to, to um, convert that to code. I will, I will show you uh, later on, I will show you BPM workflow that Evan uses in this demo, which is quite a simple forward only workflow, which is translated to code very easily, but if you have some other constructs that might not be as easy as it, sound, as it uh, looks like. Um, I want to support the most used elements, so uh, service tasks, user tasks, uh, uh, boundary events, timing, timer events, um, uh, all these, these constructs you see often in BPN diagrams. Uh, and next to that, there are different different gateways within BPMAN. I will show you, show you the, later in the diagram. And I want to support the most use of those also. Um, what the generator should do is take the BPMAN diagram, 
uh, generate a, a, a depot workflow class and also generate uh, partial activity classes um, for like the service, the service task within, within the BPM workflow. Those are empty, empty partial classes that later on can be, uh, can be used to implement actual uh, functionality. And besides that, you also need some way of starting the workflow and sending events to the workflow. And it would be nice if you could also generate a uh, HP.NET Core controller uh, for that purpose. So to start the instance, sending the external events for, let's say, user tasks or uh, receive message tasks. And um, maybe to even generate uh, a uh, diagram of the current state of this, uh, of this workflow. So uh, in a nutshell, the source generator is a C sharp a source generator. Um, it will generate the workflow class. It will generate a workflow state class. The workflow state class holds all the all the, the input state of the workflow, the output state of the workflow, and all this, the, the states in between uh, that you can use in your workflow to make decisions. For instance, uh, it will generate the, partially, the partial uh, activity classes that you later can use to implement your, your functionality. Um, the HP.NET Core controller class and some, some utility classes to easily add your workflow to a uh, to the dependency injection uh, framework that .NET uses. So uh, what I said was um, translating a BPM diagram to, uh, to code uh, can be easy, depends on the diagram, on the constructs are you, that are used. If it's a forward only workflow, that means you start at, at the beginning and, uh, and you, it flows always uh, uh, in one go to the end with some decisions in between, some different paths, then it's easy to, to translate that to code uh, in a procedural way uh, using if then else constructs and all the constructs you are used to in, in, a, in a normal procedural code. But if there are flows that are going back, uh, uh, branch off in parallel um, flows, these uh, generating code from that would be uh, much more difficult. Um, I'm now going to switch uh, to the code, which makes it easier to talk about these things. Um, I will show you a forward-only diagram first. And this is the, the diagram that uh, Edwin uses in his uh, demo. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a diagram that is basically a process of, um, it's a loan application process uh, with a lot of uh, automatic tasks. Those are the service tasks with the, uh, with the gears. Uh, some user tasks. So here we're going to wait for user input, external input. Uh, basically, we are translating that to waiting for an event. Um, there are some decisions in between and some different paths. But if you look at this workflow, you will see if you start here, you can basically um, follow follow the flows, and you will end up in the end. And there's no there's no flow back or there are no uh, parallel gateways or that fork different paths or parallel paths. But this is quite it's a simple, uh, simple workflow uh, to translate to code, actually. Now, if we look at the workflow I'm using to gen for testing the generator, uh, hopefully, this is a little bit zoomed in, but I will scroll to the end. It's basically the same workflow, but I added some uh, not so useful constructs to the end, um, basically for testing. And you see here parallel, for instance, a parallel gateway where we fork different paths. Um, 
and even have sub processes um, firing off and doing all these these things. And even if we go, if we would go from from such from such a task back back to a previous task, then the code that you need to generate is uh, is not so easy. So if we look at the generated code, so here we have the, the, the generator itself, I'm not going to into that in detail, but if you look at the generated code, you will see different classes that are generated. One of them is the workflow itself. And if we look at the workflow uh, itself, at the main, sorry for this, EPMN. Looking at the main, um, the main, the main uh, function in this workflow, what we see here is that I basically it's a loop, and it starts with a the first the first element in the workflow that start event, that is this one, and basically it calls that first one, and every every uh, basically every uh, flow node in the bpm diagram is translated to a, a private function on this workflow and the private function those private functions methods all have the same signature and basically what they do is um, uh, returning the next uh, things that need to happen so the main loop only loops as long as there are return values and just call that call those return values. So if, for instance, we look here, we see some of those methods, we see the gateways, some gateways that are rendered here. And you, what you see here is what they will, they return the, uh, the next, uh, basically the, the next thing in the workflow that needs to happen. And by doing this, Basically, every every element in the workflow becomes its own um, uh, function, and we can just look basically to all all the functions that are returned, and and the last function will return um, an empty array, and then we're basically done executing uh, executing the workflow. And this allows us to also have loops um, go back in the workflow have very uh, complicated constructs in BPMAN and it will just uh, not, we don't have any uh, issues with uh, uh, call stacks, uh, recursive functions. It's, it's basically doing every, every single step in the workflow is a call to a function in this, from this main loop. So there's no nesting, there's no very deep call stack. This is the workflow. Um, which also is generated as the uh, ASP.NET Core controller class, where you can see where we can start the workflow, um, get the XML, but also raise different events. So basically for every user task in the workflow, uh, a operation is generated. Um, so you can so you can basically go back into the workflow and say, okay, this this task is completed, and the workflow will continue. And one of the questions is, does the code generator support multiple languages? No, for now, uh, not for now, uh, because it was uh, we are uh, basically focused on C sharp. Um, at this point, uh, but it's it, it can be done for other languages, uh, uh, of course. But for now, it's only C sharp, and we're using a C sharp uh, code generator feature to uh, to make this work. But it can be done for other languages, of course. Um, one of one of the other things that are generated um, is the um, workflow state. This is an object that is created that, uh, when the workflow starts. It basically takes the input. This is the input. Uh, this is the output uh, of the workflow. Um, and then 
you see all these other properties. Those are properties that are basically generated um, mostly from the gateways. If we if we go back to the uh, go back to the workflow. And we just look at the XML. We for, we see that there are some ex extensions in the uh, added to the uh, to the uh, VPN XML, where we basically specify the different types for the types used for the input of and the output of the workflow. And we also see that for some of the user tasks where we where we also specify these these kind of types um, for the output of the activity or that is generated, and adding all, adding these few annotations, we can basically generate the state class from those from those extensions. Um, Going back to the generated code, you also see the uh, activities in here. Those map to uh, to the activities in the uh, in the diagram. M basically, the service the service uh, tasks in the diagram. A, a uh, partial class is generated for those activities, and uh, it's partial, which means that in your in your code in your actual code, um, you will see those same classes again. But now they, this will implement uh, functionality for those activities. Um, let's try, and this is a demo, so hopefully it will go OK. I will show you and try to run this. Right. There's a HTTP file which has all the calls to the controller. That to the, these are calls to the generate controller. Uh, here we can start the uh, the workflow. Um, we define some input. That is the uh, the loan application uh, object um, that is input for the workflow. Uh, and basically, and, and based on what, what we enter here on, on values, uh, different parts in the workflow can be taken. Um, so now I will send a request. And you will see, you will see that a loan proposal was sent. And if you look here, we are almost at the end, send proposal. This was the last one that is sent, and now it's in the receive customer decision. Um, we're not going to wait for 14 days, so I will send a re an event to this, uh, to this workflow, and it will um, uh, continue the workflow uh, after this uh, task. So let's send customer decision. That is this one. We'll send it. And if you look at the actual logging, uh, we also see that now we are arrived at the end of the, the workflow and the orchestration is, uh, is completed at this point. And let's, let's try this again. Sending a request. What I can also do uh, is getting a diagram. And this is a diagram basically of the, the current instance, which also uh, annotates um, where you can see where, where you are in the workflow. What it does generates a, uh, an SVG file. 
Let's uh, save this. Um, it's probably a bit too small. And here you can see the, the same diagram as I showed before, but now you can see that we are basically uh, after the same proposal and, and we are basically waiting for the received customer decision to complete. This is basically the functionality we have at the moment in this proof of concept. It's a, uh, it is still a proof of concept. We are not uh, planning on, on doing anything uh, more than a proof of concept at, at this point in time. Uh, but we are looking uh, at this uh, also for some customers. Uh, we, we, might, we might want to do this uh, to, to replace, uh, replace current uh, BPMN engines uh, that are uh, uh, not continued anymore, or, or we want to move to, uh, to a more, more code-based uh, solution like that workflow. Um, and I think that's all I have for now. Um, uh, it's, on, it's on GitHub and it's, it's, free, it's free for you to uh, get some inspiration from. Um, the, the demos from uh, where this is based on, the demo from Edwin is also on GitHub. Um, you can find an implementation uh, uh, also over there. Uh, and that uh, concludes my uh, um, my demo for today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. This is uh, re really cool to see you, Niet. Yeah, I was really uh, excited when you showed this to me a couple of weeks ago. So uh, thank you for for joining uh, this community call and and, and show to the world. Um, as, as you mentioned, it's it's a proof of concept. Uh, it's, it's it's not like very actively under development. You might uh, do something for it for 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 client work in, in the future. Um, yeah, so it, it is open source and on GitHub. So are, are you like uh, happy to accept um, yeah, like, like pull requests or are, are you happy to accept contributors? Uh, uh, you have like sure. a like a call call to action to uh, to the audience. Then then now is your moment. <laughs> sure, if people are interested um, and they want to bring this uh, uh, further than than the current state, then then of course I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to accept contributors uh, and, and and work on this for sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have uh, interest, I've shared the, the link also uh, in, in, in the comments and uh, the, we'll also share the link in the description as well once this is uh, fully recorded. Um, so yeah, please have a look there. If you have ideas, I always recommend to start with uh, GitHub issue first and to uh, to, to, to connect with, uh, with, with with Mark or any other maintainers first uh, before you actually start start coding on it. But yeah, def definitely give it a try and, and try to prove content yourself. Really cool. I do have a question. So um, I, I like the idea of the of the partial classes, right? So if if, uh, if for instance a, a small change to the workflow is made, so yeah, so maybe like a, a different workflow order or an extra activities, uh, then it's still safe to execute the generation again of all of the classes, right? Because your own implementation uh, is on the, in those partial activity classes, right? As long as you don't rename IDs in your yeah 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 or, or rename workflow. workflow steps or something yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. it's basically the same as hey you should you should also be very careful with of course uh, workflows in code in general with changing the order or renaming activities and stuff like that or changing payloads and things uh, so yeah the, the same applies here I guess yeah yes. cool all right okay uh, well uh, again uh, thanks a lot and yeah we'll we'll share everything in the uh, in the description later and also on Dapper Discord. Okay, thank you for having me. Okay, cheers. All right, uh, it is time for our next presenter, and that is Ryan. Here we go. Hello, Ryan. You also want to share your screen? Oh, I think you're still muted. Hey, hey Mark, let me present my screen. Yes. Okay, because here you're here to tell us about IR. Azure IoT operations and Dapper plugable components. So uh, these are two yes. very exciting topics. Let me that. 
Yes, that's right. Um, let me just bring up my slides. Okay, um, how do I make this full screen? Let's click here. Yeah, click at the shower slideshow, yes. Okay. okay, hi everyone, my name's uh, Ryan Winter. I'm a program manager as part of the um, uh, Azure Edge team. Uh, so what we do is we work on uh, connecting on-prem devices to the Azure cloud. We use that by deploying an Edge, which is a Kubernetes cluster. Um, to the on-prem and that's used as the bridge between um, their on-prem on devices and the cloud. Uh, so what is our Azure IoT operations? Well, it's a it's a it's basically a data plane for the edge. It's used to marshal data um, from the customer site to the cloud. Uh, we basically built it around an MQTT5 compliant broker. That's a new broker that we've created specifically for uh, our edge scenario. And uh, it's built to be distributed and highly available. Uh, and at the moment, we're we're still in preview, but we're integrating with a, a qu quite a few upstream um, Azure uh, services, such as Event Hub, Event Grid, and Fabric. And uh, as I mentioned, it runs on Kubernetes, and it's um, it uses it leverages Azure Arc, and Azure Arc is a is a service that Azure provides, which um, basically lets you control your uh, own resources uh, via the Azure cloud. Uh, so in this case, we're using uh, a Kubernetes de deployment on the uh, local machine and Arc surfaces that de um, that deployment in uh, as a resource in Azure so that we can then use, leverage that um, tunnel to deploy our additional pieces. Uh, so here's a um, kind of convoluted architecture diagram. It's, it's a little bit a lot in here, but um, I think on the right here, you see sort of the cloud um, section, which is the Azure. And on the left, you sort of see, in the middle, you see the edge. This is um, this is basically our bridge. This is where Azure IT operations runs. And on the left, you kind of see the different devices that the customer may have on-prem, whether they're MQTT devices or cameras, or in this case, um, I, I think it's it's a proprietary factory protocol, not proprietary, an open factory protocol called OPC UA. Um, and we provide that bridge. And, and the great thing about, um, this, this Azure IT operations is that targets both devices such as MQTT or um, devices that are natively um, internet available, but also we do provide the ability to bridge to other devices that may be um, using some proprietary protocol or um, may not even be um, TCP IP. So if I get into a slightly, okay, so coming coming to Dapper, we'll probably, we're, we're all here. Um, so uh, for us, we're servicing Dapper as a first-class interface. Um, we obviously are based on MQTT, so we, we natively support MQTT5, and we also uh, are developing a set of SDKs. Um, but we see Dapper as one of the pillars that we want to use for customers to be able to build on top of Azure IoT operations. Uh, we currently support state management and the PubSub components. And uh, as Mark mentioned, we utilize the pluggable component interface. It's a... It's a um, it's an interface that Dapper provides that allows you to build your pluggable components outside of the Dapper code base and deploy them alongside the, the Dapper sidecar um, in your cluster. So the good thing about, uh, the reason why we chose this path is uh, a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, we're still in preview. We're still actively developing the, um, the system. So we wanted to be decoupled from, you know, the Dapper release cycle because um, we're iterating so quickly. Um, and the second thing is that, the pluggable component interface gives us a bit more flexibility in terms of languages. Uh, so we we are targeting Go and .NET, but .NET is a language that we're a little bit further along with. So our pluggable components actually um, are switching from Go to .NET. Uh, in the future, we do plan to contribute back um, to Dapper um, and make this a, as a as a primary Dapper component. Uh, so some of the things we're working on next, obviously, yeah, moving towards Dapper in the future, um, coming becoming part of the Dapper code base and, and moving away from pluggable components is something that we want to investigate. Uh, we also plan to add um, natively support cloud events. At the moment, we mostly um, focus on raw MQTT events uh, because that's where our customers kind of are coming today. But cloud events is definitely something we want to expand to in the future and across all of Azure IT operations, not just the Dapper components. Um, and then we, we also want to evaluate some of the additional component types. 
such as bindings, configuration, store, and distributed log. So these components aren't available today as pluggable components. So to support these, we will need to um, author these in Go and, and contribute back to Dapper itself. Uh, so here's an example of like what we sort of expect customers to um, to utilize Dapper for. Uh, one, of the, one of the examples, there's two examples we, we want customers to use Dapper for. One is processing on the edge, which is this example. Um, so in here, the customer might have a couple of IoT devices that are pushing data into the MQC broker. Um, and we can deploy an edge app here that uh, it basically works through the sidecar to talk to our two pluggable components, the state store and pub sub. So this edge app would then monitor the topic that those IT devices are publishing to. It would pull that data in. Um, it could use the state store to temporarily store some state. Um, and then it can then publish back to the broker with on a new topic uh, with some uh, after the processing has happened on the data. And I have an example app where we where I provided that information, uh, provided that implementation. Um, and then typically this this event broker, uh, the, the broker in the edge will then bridge to the um, event grid broker in the cloud. And then you'd have some cloud app that you would then consume that data. Uh, so let me see. Okay, so for the demo today, I'm gonna to be running through um, a Dapper app using the Dapper Python SDK. Uh, this is gonna communicate with the Azure IT operations MQTC broker both through the PubSub pluggable component and we also have a state store pluggable component. Uh, so this is all outlined in this tutorial, which is available on our Learn website. So there'll be a link to this. Uh, if we come through here, uh, we can see that the um, application is just going to subscribe to a sensor data topic. Uh, it's going to uh, stash that data in the state store and uh, every 10 seconds, it's going to fetch the data from the state store and calculate a 30 second um, sliding window. And then it's going to output that to a different topic, the sensor window underscore data. Um, so let's move on. Oh, and also this, this, this tutorial doesn't use cloud events. It's disabled in this case, we're just using raw MQTT. Um, so the first thing to do up here is to deploy IT operations. If we follow the link, um, there's instructions here on how to deploy it. Ultimately, what it does is it takes you to this uh, GitHub repo called Explore IT Operations. And from here, you can actually uh, create a code, code spaces, which will have um, a deployment, uh, a KS cluster deployed automatically using K3S. So this just creates an easy way to set up a sandboxed environment. Um, so I've already done that part, and then I've actually already installed AIO or Azure IoT operations. Uh, so that's running in this cluster here in my crispy space fork code space. So if I take a look in here, I'm using a tool called K9S, which comes as part of the code space. Uh, it just allows you to navigate through your um, different components. Uh, of the cluster a bit easier. So if we look around in here, we can see uh, there's a bunch of Azure Arc services running. There's uh, quite a few different IT operations services running. We're specifically interested in these uh, MQ ones, which is the distributed um, MQTC broker running on the edge. If I keep going down, uh, we eventually have the data sidecar I've already installed that. So uh, IT operations takes about I mean, it could take about 15 minutes to 30 minutes to install. So I did that off camera to save everyone that part of it. Uh, what's So if we come back to the tutorial and keep scrolling down, um, the, the other thing we need to do is install the uh, Dapper components. So we have these two pluggable components that are not part of the Dapper itself. So they need to be installed um, separately. So if we look in here, install Dapper, we've already done that. Uh, and then if we come down a bit more, we have some YAML here, which defines the two components, the pub sub at the top and the state store at the bottom. Um, so this has some annotations in here, which contains the mount paths for the authentication and the certificates um, so that we can securely connect to IoT, uh, IoT operations. So uh, let me deploy that to the cluster. I've already um, downloaded that and 
saved it to this code space. So if I so out of this and uh, let's change into the what folder am I in? I think I'm already in the right folder. So let's do a few puddle apply to the components, right? And they've both been created on the cluster. Um, and then looking back at the tutorial, um, we can see we've completed this. We don't need to cover the authorization. We're just going to leave that alone. If we come back to the tutorial and keep scrolling down, so we basically need to install the Dapper app. Um, the YAML in here just defines a, a basic service account. And then the deployment here, the interesting parts are the annotations. So it enables uh, Dapper. And um, the second line here, uh, it injects, it enables pluggable component injection. So the uh, Dapper will automatically find the components for me and add them to the pod. I don't have to find them in my uh, Dapper, uh, my deployment, sorry, which makes things a bit easier. Uh, and then scrolling down, we've got some authentication and certificates mounted in the um, in the container, and then the actual container image itself down the bottom. I've uh, pre-compiled the container and pushed it into a GitHub container registry, so you can consume it directly from here um, rather than build it yourself. So let's deploy that. Coming back here, I'm gonna. I have the app YAML here. Um, I've added a. Uh, an additional broker listener at the top. So by default, we uh, use MQTS uh, and it's it's um, there's authorizations enabled. So I've also deployed a, um, a just a non-encrypted, non-authenticated uh, interface to our MQT broker just for, uh, it just makes it a bit easier to see what's going on for debugging. Let me apply the app YAML. All right, so it's created the broker listener, the service account, and it's created my actual app. Uh, if we come back to K9S, uh, we should be able to see the app here. So what view am I in here? Let me just switch to a different view. Uh, oh, these are the deployments. Let's go to the pods. Okay, so it's here. Uh, if we enter into this, we can see there are three containers running. The top one contains both the pluggable components. Uh, the second one is Dapper itself. It's currently 113, I think, 114, maybe up. Um, and the bottom one is my Python app. And if we take a look at this, press L to get a log, we can see this has started um, and it's just running a time loop. It's just waiting for some input. We don't have any input yet. Dapper has a bunch of output. Nothing looks bad in there. And if I look at the pluggable components, um, we can see the pub sub component spinning up here and connecting, sending a connect, conac. And then we can see the state store also with a connect to the broker. So both the pluggable components have successfully established that connection. Let's escape back out of here. So the next step would be to generate some input. So this is monitoring the um, the data topic, data, I can't remember what the topic was, but uh, it's some specific topic. So we can just deploy a simulator that just pushes out onto that topic. Um, so this is already in the repo, um, simulate data. It's just a bash script that uses mosquito pub to push data to the sensor data topic. So let's deploy that. Okay, so that's deployed. Um, let's come back here and see if it's all working as expected. So there's the deployment. Let's do a log on that. And I can see here that it's publishing, um, it's publishing messages. So we saw five within a 10 second window. Uh, so I, it's outputting every two seconds. Or oh, there's a sleep every two seconds. So that looks like it's working. Now I've got MQTX running here um, and I can take a look using the non-secure port I opened. Um, so I've forwarded in within um, uh, VS Code, I forwarded 1883 to my local machine so I can access my code spaces uh, from my local machine. And uh, I could see the output. So it's just generating random numbers for temperature, pressure, and vibration. 
and it's just running. It's uh, outputting every two seconds. Um, sorry, this is not connected. This was a previous test I was running. Okay, so yes, that's now working. Okay, so the next question is that, uh, let's take a look at the app quickly, just to see what this is doing. This is a pretty standard um, Dapper app based on some of the samples they have in uh, some of the awesome samples they have in their repos. Uh, so it's just doing two things. We have a subscribe here. It's subscribing to that topic. Um, it's enabled raw payloads, which just it's, it's means it now long, it no longer expects the cloud events um, wrapper to be present, which is in this case, we're sending a raw payload. So it's exactly what we want. Um, and in here, it's just uh, extracting the data, it's doing some validation, and then it constructs a state store. And from the state store, it gets the state and it appends the new data point to the state and it stores it back in the state store. Um, so this the state in the state store is just an ever-growing JSON list. Uh, and then down here, we have a, um, uh, a loop which is running every 10 seconds. Um, and this basically gets the state from the state store. Um, it discards any data that's older than 30 seconds. It processes the data, so it performs some aggregation. And then it saves the state back to the state store minus the data points that were uh, expired. And then it um, creates the payload. Uh, append data is down below. It does the aggregations. And then it publishes them um, back to the PubSub um, com pluggable component. Uh, and once again, it enables raw payloads. So we're, we're, not, we're not doing a cloud event output here. And then if we go down here, the um, append data is just doing a couple of min-max and uh, math operations on that. Um, and if we go back to here and go to our sensor window data um, subscription, every 10 seconds, we should hopefully, fingers crossed, see uh, a window output. Uh, and there it is. So the window size 30 seconds, uh, and we see the aggregations for each of the each of the um, simulated data uh, simulated data that we're pushing in. Um, and it looks like there are 14 data points included. I'm not sure why there's not 15 in a 30 second interval, but um, that's close enough. Uh, so um, that's about it. So I think everything that that covers through the tutorial. So. You know, to recap, we're subscribed to a topic using Dapper. Um, we receive the data and then we store that data in the state store um, using the state store component. Um, and then in a loop, which runs every 10 seconds, we fetch the data from the state store and we do some aggregation and we publish to an additional topic. Um, so yeah, so that's everything. Um, please come and give it a try. We are still in preview, uh, so uh, things are, do break occasionally as we, we, we're pushing very quickly and editing very quickly. Uh, if you have any issues, feel free to create a bug in the Explore IT Operations um, GitHub repo, and, and, and we'll get to it as quickly as we can. Um, but yeah, that would be it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, no, it's actually great that you're using Dapper pluggable components because I don't see a lot of usage of them out there in, in the wild. Uh, so it's great to have uh, to see a use case of it uh, here. Uh, so they're definitely like very flexible, right? Because you're like in total control of uh, how these are used and how you can create them because yeah, you, you write them yourself, right? Either in Go or in .NET uh, these days. Yeah, definitely. Like I mentioned, the two advantages was it really managed, it enables, enables us to decouple from, from the Dapper release cycle, which... Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we can iterate very, very quickly, um, and and also the additional language support was, was very useful for us. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'll definitely share some additional links in the uh, video description later uh, for people to read a bit about uh, the pluggable components themselves, because I do know that some organizations actually. Um, uh, Use Dapper pluggable components uh, for in, in case they may may uh, may use some uh, some state store that is not um, uh, 
com completely supported by Dapper because it may be very old or, or but what's also sometimes used that uh, people combine several resources and uh, create one pluggable component, which is then used both as a state store and as a pops up and something else as, as a binding. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's definitely very, very versatile and, and flexible. Cool. All right. Okay, I've shared the link to the Microsoft Learn document. So if you want to try this out, uh, yeah, definitely have a look at, uh, at this page and, and the Git repo is also linked in here. Uh, I noticed, so that's, uh, that's great. Uh, oh, Mark is asking a question. Uh, do the use of Dapper APIs enable customers to build apps faster on IoT operations? Uh, um, it's, it's not that, it's, I mean, yes, I would say yes. Yes and no. Uh, it, it really depends on um, the customer's uh, understanding or the customer's background and, and you know what they use internally. If you're familiar with Dapper, then definitely like you know Dapper, like any other framework, there's some onboarding required. Um, but it, Dapper does provide a ton of stuff out of the box. I, I think one thing that I didn't mention was that uh, I showed a, um, an edge deployment, um, so where you're processing on the edge. The other great thing about Dapper, it has tons and tons of third-party integration. Well, not third-party, I guess they're part. It integrates with a lot of other cloud services. So you, you can, um, you know, as part of that, you could you could reach out to different cloud services um, outside of the ones that Azure IT operations supports um, and, in, and directly communicate with them rather than having to, like, work with um, those different services and use their SDKs and things like that. Uh, so I would say definitely. Um, but we, we also provide... I mean, for us, it's it's less about um, providing it, making it faster for customers to gener uh, to generate these apps. It's really about providing customers with choices. So we can use your S our SDK or Dapper or MQC, or we're also working on WebAssembly. Um, we want to make sure that we, we're meeting customers where they where they want want us to be. Yeah, makes total sense. Thanks. All right. Uh, well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Ryan, for. Uh for coming on today's community call. Um, and like, like I mentioned, send me a, a recording of, uh, of the demo so we can include it later. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay, let's now start with the final section and that is the um, community show and tell. Now it's time for me to share my screen. Here we go. All right, we're there. All right, so first the blog post that have been written in the last uh, two weeks. Um, so there's a part two uh, written by uh, Vladimir Vivian about building cloud native services with Dapper Go and Kubernetes. This one dives a bit more into the uh, state store and how you use the uh, state management API. Uh, definitely uh, have a look at that. Uh, the next one by uh, Tong Chung, uh, which has written some uh, Dapper and WebAssembly articles before, and now he has one article published on, uh, on DZone. Uh, also very nice if you're interested in the combination of those technologies. Uh, then uh, Yuri Butkevich uh, wrote about simplifying .NET microservices with Dapper and Azure Container Apps, also a combination which is mentioned often. Uh, apologies for the all caps title, but uh, this is how I copy pasted it from uh, from the blog post. Um, it's more like an, like an introductory um, article. Um, and finally, I've written a blog post that uh, compares uh, .NET Aspire with Dapper, uh, two greatly different uh, solutions to speed up uh, distributed application development. Uh, but there have been a lot of questions in the community on how, how do they differ exactly and uh, how can they be used together? So if you're interested in that, uh, please read this article. Then regarding uh, YouTube videos, um, there was one from um, uh, William Liebenberg. Um, uh, and this is the yeah, Coding Night New Zealand, uh, where he's talking about uh, .NET, Aspire and Dapper. So this was a recording for a, for a meetup event uh, very recently. Then uh, my uh, colleague Mauricio was interviewed by uh, Oleg uh, Selyev about uh, what, what is Dapper. So this is a YouTube short. Then uh, again, uh, Mauricio um, and spoke with, um, with Thomas Vitali about uh, Dapper and uh, Spring Boot on a uh, Spring IO conference. So we definitely see uh, more and more Java folks uh, using Dapper, which is uh, which is great to see. Then uh, Aaron Crawfish spoke about uh, Dapper and uh, uh, sustaining uh, cloud open source projects. Uh, so this is a podcast. So uh, have a listen to this if you're interested in this. 
then uh, this was a recording of a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, and again this is a combination of Dapper and Dotet Aspire uh, it's called a royal wedding uh, by uh, Florian van Dillen and then my uh, colleague Fernando uh, gave a um, webinar about end-to-end -end, uh, Dapper management in Azure with Diwit Conductor so this is now also online on YouTube uh, so if you're running Dapper in Conductor uh, on, uh, on, on Azure on AKS uh, this is a good video for you to watch. And finally, some muscle messages on uh, on social media from like Twitter and uh, and LinkedIn. So we definitely saw some pictures taken at the um, spring uh, I/O conference where Mauricio was uh, was speaking at. And then there's an announcement um, uh, from uh, Gregory that he will speak also uh, about about Dapper uh, on a um, um, MS Tech. Um, I think it's a conference uh, in in Poland. Um, then again, uh, another uh, Dapper and Spring Boot related um, uh, message from uh, from Philip Moser, uh, and finally um, another post by, by uh, Fernando Roja uh, that he is doing a Dapper session at uh, the Cloud Native Vancouver uh, meetup, uh, and this is happening um, I think tomorrow, yeah, June thirteenth. So yeah, if you're in that area, uh, please uh, please go over and uh, listen to that session. All right, so if you are writing a Dapper a blog post or recording Dapper related videos or giving sessions about Dapper, um, you can actually uh, claim these digital badges. Uh, so if you go to these links here, that's all in the Dapper slash community repository. Uh, you can add uh, the information about your blog post or the video uh, to these tables, uh, to these documents, um, and you'll be awarded um, these, these badges. And that there are many more badges also for if you're contributing to source code. Uh, so yeah, you, there's a lot of badges that you can that you can claim. And and finally, uh, there's uh, always the Dapper Community Supporter badge. So even though uh, you're not contributing code or writing blog posts or whatever, but maybe because you're here, it still means you're interested in Dapper. Uh, so um, everybody is, is free to claim this Dapper badge and feel also feel free to to share this one. All right, um, are there any more questions? Let me have a look. Um, okay, so uh, Ryan is, is answering uh, some question here in the chat. That's, that's excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, if there are no more questions, then definitely join us again in two weeks on June 26th. Um, we will definitely do a announcement regarding uh, the Dapper 114 release candidate. Uh, there will probably also be uh, like a, uh, a feature showcase about one of the new features there uh, by uh, by Cassie and maybe another session. Uh, but if you have a session yourself, uh, feel free to um, either contact me uh, or go to the GitHub uh, repo, the Dapper slash community repo, uh, and check the pinned issues there because those always uh, contain the next couple of uh, Dapper community call issues uh, with all of their agendas. So uh, there's probably some space in the agendas if you want to give a session. All right. I don't see any more questions. So uh, I think uh, I think we're done for, uh, for this community call. I um, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.